Okay, we are going to cover what I believe to be some of the most impactful learning that we can do together in women and gender studies. So titled this intersectionality, but we're going to go through a lot of different terms. First is prejudice and discrimination. I would say that people probably think to themselves that they are not discriminatory and they're probably, they would say that they're not prejudiced. I would say probably a fair amount of people don't engage in discriminatory behavior too terribly often. But I would argue that people probably engage in prejudicial treatment of others and don't always take the effort that it requires to catch themselves with their moments of being prejudicial, much I, I myself included. When I talk about these things, by virtue of learning them as a student, just like you are now, it's not as if that just checks it off the list of like human quality improvement that we all are should be on the path of doing like you still have to catch yourself when you make errors that ultimately hurt the people in your lives society around you quite honestly even in some cases yourself so as you can see in front of you prejudice is when you are making assumptions that you're being judgmental and you are not being kind about somebody and their lived experience that you technically probably don't even know about. So you're speaking about it as if you did, but you don't. Discrimination then is action. And so that looks a little bit different than just kind of where our thoughts go. Does prejudice lead to discrimination? Yeah, it does. So when we've got prejudice and discrimination on a much larger scale, that can be called oppression. And oppression is saying that not only is prejudice and discrimination existing on kind of a micro interaction level, like person to person, but it ends up built into our institutions, the medical institution, education, government. So these practices end up on a large scale. Sometimes this is called systemic. So you, or you can say systemic oppression. Um, you can say that the you know, prejudicial treatment is systemic. Other times you hear the word oppression. I think that I'm not an expert in all of this verbiage, but I'm thinking they're kind of interchangeable in this way. And so this idea of oppressions being on a larger scale. On the flip side of pr privilege, oppression, discrimination is privilege. Privilege is tricky. If you look at the definition, I know it's a little bit long, that last part of it, those with privilege do not necessarily know that they have it, but they're still at an advantage. I think that that's why privilege is tricky because if something's not your problem, you're not going to think of it, right? It's because it's because it's not something you have to deal with. If something is something you have to deal with, something that hurts you, something that stresses you, something that impacts your life in a negative way, yeah, you're, you're going to be aware of it. Like people realize the prejudice and discrimination that they face. People know the oppressive, systematic, discriminatory treatment they receive based upon institutions. The people who experience that, they know it. They have to endure it. It's incredibly scary, painful, and every other negative adjective I could possibly think of. But when you're benefiting, when you don't have to worry about something, it's not always in the forefront of your mind. You can see on the left is a, a example of actually it was a college up in the San Francisco area that had a group organization that put flyers all around the school to kind of bring attention to moments of privilege. Uh, you see the one that's in relation to being able to utilize restrooms without a concern of um if your gender identity doesn't fit neatly into the binary because our bathrooms are divided by the gender binary, like if you don't have to give a second thought to what restroom to use in a public space, you have cisgender privilege. Cisgender means you fit into the binary. You're either female-bodied and feminine or male, masculine-bodied, male-bodied and masculine. Um, they had flyers that were at the top of the hill on a campus and saying, hey, if you could walk up here without, you know, really worrying about your mobility you have able-bodied privilege. Um, you know, quite, they had ones on religion. And if you get certain holidays off uh, from school, like you might have um, religious privilege and so on and on and on. And again, the point of this was to bring attention. In this course, we're going to be doing a big activity on privilege. So you want to kind of go through and take the time. And the purpose of it is 
paying attention to so many things that maybe we take for granted. Now, for some of us, we're going to be answering questions and like, no, I have to face these negative, prejudicial, discriminatory, oppressive things each day. For others, we're going to go through lists and be like, wow, I didn't, I didn't even think about any of this. The things that people face whether it's in relation to being neurotypical with things like mental health, whether it's in relation to, I just was mentioning able-bodied privilege, but intellectual um, privilege and not necessarily dealing with an intellectual disability of some kind. Um, Citizenship, like there's so many different areas of privilege and things that oftentimes people are taking for granted. So now let's get to that term intersectionality. Intersectionality is... um, the term that indicates it's it's work that's done by you can see Kimberly Crenshaw. It's work that indicates that you cannot understand a person's lived experience based upon one part of their identity. It is the intersection that creates various uh, privileges sometimes or oppressions. The experience of all women universally is impacted by race is impacted by socioeconomic status and the amount of monetary resources or that 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 our person may have it could be impacted by sexual identity could be impacted by age so that's just taking like the definition the 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 idea the concept the what we define as a woman like so many different identities are going to intersect that unless you really take a look at somebody's entire lived experience and all of their identities, you don't really, really have a sense of what it is they face. And those intersections can create kind of unique to that particular intersection of identity. Again, discriminatory treatment that somebody may face that, you know, there's two People who have a middle class background, but based upon like racial identity or something that, you know, that could be that one person receives all different kinds of treatment or kind of prejudicial right assumptions about society. And another person doesn't, even though they still have the same amount of socioeconomic resources. So it's interesting to really start to pay attention to the fact that none of these things truly exist by themselves in a way that we can then speak holistically about a person's lived experience you you can't really look and understand what somebody has gone through in relation to one of their identities unless you really start to look at the way that they're impacted by all of them something else I want to share with you we're kind of going through some of that core um, amazing theories in women's studies intersectionality being one of them intersectionality is a theory that's it's utilized in sociology Um, I will be honest nowadays when you hear that term critical race theory in our um, news cycles and things like that, and when those term, that terminology is being used, intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw is one of the theorists that that's, that's where the, the, that is what people are fighting against. The, the, the opportunity to look at a person's lived experience from all different angles. That's kind of one of the basis of it. Not, not an entire discussion about it. So, Okay. Somebody else I want to introduce you to is the work of Patricia Hill Collins. Um, I, there's so many different things we could read in this class. We're not reading them all. And so what I'm kind of doing is taking some of her work and summarizing it so you have some exposure to it. So a couple of different concepts that I think are really, really interesting to carry forth from uh, Patricia Hill Collins. One of them is the, the how knowledge is created. That's a lot of uh, Collins's work, like how... The how do we get the knowledge that we have? And a lot of times that's been done by who? Who wrote the books historically? Whose voices were out there historically? Collins describes it as the European masculinist knowledge validation process, which I think would make a fantastic insult to somebody. Like, I really don't appreciate your European masculinist knowledge validation process. Sounds There's a lot of good words in there. But as you see this image in front of you, this idea of the little girl who sees a man taming this gigantic, ferocious lion going, well, that can't happen. And they're standing in front of a statue. Their mom's like, well, yeah, but who made the statue? Like, you can tell whatever story you want when you have the resources 
to have your voice heard, right? I mean, that statue is really quite honestly one of, I guess, if you think about it, one of the things in our world that it's, it's big and heavy and not going anywhere. It's going to make a statement. So if you have the resources to create imagery and writing and language, all this type of stuff, like it's going to be your perception, like your voice, your ideas, your knowledge is going to be what's disseminated into the world. So that idea of the European masculinist knowledge validation process, Patricia Hill Collins then says it should, you know, one of the other options, one of the other epistemologies, which is kind of knowledge, uh, ways of knowledge, ways of understanding, developing and creating and uh, exploring knowledge is an Afrocentrist feminist epistemology. So it's a moment to catch our prejudices, right? Oh, well, is an Afrocentrist feminist epistemology as that's catch yourself. That's something I would be like, oh, but wait, the like European masculinist kind of knowledge has been around for centuries. Where do we get the ideas that we get? Where do, where can we catch ourselves being prejudicial and making assumptions when it, it's not necessarily fair at all? Okay, one other thing I wanted to cover with you from Patricia Collins' work that I think is just really interesting. It's kind of going along the same lines of how knowledge is formed and what we value in a society. So as you can see on the screen in front of you, I think that this is a really neat little anecdote. In her writing, Patricia Collins shares Miss Shea's assessment of saying that, you know, I, I'm not necessarily academically educated, can say, as she says, a 34-word answer when only three would do. Like, no, I mean, what was I just saying? European masculinist knowledge validation process. Like, I don't know all the vocabulary the, the, you know, all, all of the fancy words to use. But a lot of times all these fancy words, as you can see, kind of can cover up a truth, right? We can just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. We can write and write and write and write and write. We can use all the fancy vocabulary. But are, are we being clear? Remember with when we talked at the very beginning about critical thinking? Fair is one of them. Clear is another one. Those 34 words can be very vague because you just, you're saying a whole lot without saying anything. But what would a three word truth be? I've done this as an activity. We're not going to do it in here because again, we're a little bit crunched for time. But if you were to think about, because it's really poignant. I've had classes do this. Tell me, each student has to come up with what's their three word truth. And then I'll put them all in a list. And it's just, it's super powerful. But try and catch yourself when, if I totally am a 34-word person, as the example is in front of us, as I'm sure you can tell by having to listen to me. But that idea of what do we value in society? Whose voices do we value? Whose voices get heard? Whose knowledge do we hold as the truth, as fact? Whose lived experience do we value? Like, just... I, I think it's really interesting to think about when we live in a lot of times a 34 word world, what, what should be our three word truths? Okay. Getting through this one last theorist I want to share with you that you'll be reading work from is Gloria Hanseldua. I always feel like I'm mispronouncing her name, so I hope I'm not. Reading about her work in relation to Borderlands is another way of looking at intersectionality. It's a poetic way. So Anseldua uses poetry and uses imagery. Um, she uses this in her writing to describe her lived experience as a Chicana woman whose sexual identity is at odds with her cultural norms and religiously informed cultural norms. And so this idea of borderlands, and I'm showing you her words, in front of you and like on the screen as we go through and it's just it's beautiful borders are artificial we build them we define that you know here's the edge of one city i, I live in santa Ana, and i live right in the corner by orange and tustin 
like right at the corner of like the three cities coming together. There's a sign, right? That's how I know that like Orange is right there and Tustin's right there and San Ana is right here. There's no, it's a bit, I mean, we, we erect fences, not necessarily for cities, but for countries at times. We've had that conversation. But this idea, her imagery, you can't fence the ocean, right? You can't, you can't run a fence the length of the Pacific or Atlantic or you, you can't, like, you can't, you can try to throw up artificial dividers, but ultimately, like the, th and think about the beauty and the symbolism of an ocean, the depth, the, the life, the power, the, like, just the, again, the beauty that you can't, you can't cut that in half. She talks about carrying home on her back, that she creates her own home. And again, this is about her identity, creating her own space, creating a place in society for herself where her whole self feels valued. I really, really, really hope that you find just the, like I've said a couple of times, the beauty in her words, the, like, I, like just the, the, the brave, lovely opportunity to learn with such heart and soul. It's not always part of our college experience. I, I wish, but I, I don't think, you know, um, statistics class or like, I don't know chemistry class is going to have like this kind of heart and soul in it. Women in gender studies has this kind of heart and soul, looks to people to explain the world around them and values their voice. So that's what I leave you with in relation to valuing voices. As I learn, and I'm a voracious learner, like beyond, if I could spend every single day of my life just learning more and more and more, I would be a happy person. But what I have learned about intersectionality, what I have learned about understanding privilege and race and gender and all of these social constructs is that the more I learn, the more I realize I will never learn enough. Like it just kind of like is a never ending cycle of more and more and more, which can get overwhelming at times, but also can be really, really energizing. And again, something just remarkable and Something that requires humility. As I share this last slide, um, up in the upper right and left is never my strong suit. <laughs> I need to learn right and left too. But those just the couple of years ago, because I am a voracious reader, um, like reading about the lived experience, whether it's nonfiction books or especially fiction books, because a lot of times, like I said, that's kind of where as like Gloria Anzalua's work, like when people are utilizing fiction and poetry and stories, like it, it reaches your heart in a different way. But this idea of when you have privileged identities, because you're going to go through the privilege activity, just like I, I've put it together from different resources, you'll see all those resources at the end. But as you learn more and more about privilege, you realize that you're, you have a fair amount of privilege in various identities that you don't even necessarily think of. And so how do you utilize that privilege? And how, if for some reason, you have privilege in relation to your sexual identity. How, how do you utilize that privilege to be an ally to those who face discrimination and prejudicial treatment and societal oppressions? How do you do that in relation to race? How do you do that in relation to socioeconomic status? How do you do that in relation to ability and people who have disabilities? It's a lot to do, but we can do it with every little action that we choose to do and every little thing that we choose to learn and every little thing we time we try to catch ourselves from being prejudicial, we start to make changes in society. So I hope that you are finding as you go through and take a look and continue to learn about this. I hope you find that kind of enthusiasm too.